Stay tuned for Dolly Reads for You with host Dolly Howard and her sidekick Colleen Kelly. Next on Haggy Shack Radio. Time to sail away into bookland. And you are live. Oh, oh, okay. Um, I was just gonna put this down and see what, uh, Craig posted, but I can look later. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. This is another Tuesday. It is July 26, 2016. And you're listening to Dolly Reads for You. And, uh, I wanted to mention that tomorrow will be the second year that Dave has had transitioned over to where he is now. Two years ago, he did that. And I want to say I miss him on WSR. I don't miss him here at home. Because he comes to see me all the time, and I am so appreciative of that. I, I thoroughly enjoy being continuing contact with Dave. But um, I just wanted to mention, it's been two years, and I think that WSR has come a long way in those two years. I really think that, uh, we've done good. And speak of the devil. Hi, Dave. <laughs> yes, your ears were ringing. I was mentioning to them you've been gone for two years as of tomorrow over on where you are now. Not that you're gone, gone. I was gonna say, he ain't gone, damn it. <clears throat> right, he's letting me know that. <laughs> Oh, and he brought a chair. Which chair? His comfy chair. He says he's going to pull up his chair, sit down, and stick around a little while today. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. He says he he misses doing WSR, and and he misses the relationship he had with us back then. And now he, he does enjoy and appreciate the relationships that he has with all of us now because he pops in he says and he sees everybody <laughs> and some people he's hands on with <laughs> you know you all know who you are <laughs> Dave. I do love you Vanessa says hi. She, oh, he already knows that. <laughs> okay. Then I'm not going to repeat what anyone says in there because you already know it. <laughs> he says, don't get snippy with me. <laughs> he wants you to change now. <laughs> <laughs> and he's laughing his head off. <laughs> this laughing makes me laugh. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> He's so glad he got me started reading. He said that was one of his major accomplishments on this side because of what we've done with the reading, uh, all of us reading different materials to the people, and it's all materials that they need to hear. And he got me on... As your, um, co-hoster sort of person, which led into the production. Yeah. Although I didn't realize that at the time. <laughs> he is very proud of that. <clears throat> he says you have surpassed what he thought you would do. Na, 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 na. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> he says you're very welcome. He's proud of all of us. Oh, and he said, if I hadn't have done Durfee, Dolly reads for you, um, I never would have, he never would have been able to push me into 
the did show, Dilly Dallying and Dolly World. And he says that's an important show. Well, you know what? I've got to say, too, and yes, it is. But I've got to say, too, if he hadn't engineered your doing the Dolly Reads for you and then having me come on, Mm -hmm. I don't think I'd be producing. Uh, Heck, Colleen, I wonder if WSR would still be here. JP couldn't have done it by himself. Oh, heck no, because it is... People don't realize what all it does take, and I'm just amazed that Dave did it all by himself. Mm-hmm. You know, the it does take an awful lot of time, uh, an awful lot of work behind the scenes, even when you're not live and producing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, if he hadn't a, said, Dolly, why don't you do this show? Or why don't you read books or whatever? He said, Dolly, you're going to do it. What day do you want? <laughs> <laughs> One hour or two. <laughs> Dolly, you're live. <laughs> Get your book. <clears throat> yeah. He's laughing about that, too. <laughs> but, yeah, I think if all of that hadn't happened, uh, I don't know that we'd be still up and running. I don't think we would have. And, uh, I think JP would probably say the same. Mm-hmm. I do, too, because he was getting burned out. Oh, yeah, it happens, too. I mean, even I have to kind of sit back and or step back sometimes myself, mm-hmm. and that's splitting it with J.P., so, yep, yep. Mm-hmm. He's just very proud of, of the accomplishment, and he's proud of himself for, for sticking through and and doing it. Is he patting himself on the back? No, he's just very matter-of-factly saying it. He's he's not being silly or anything. He's just being serious, right? Oh. Now. And that's nice to see. He recognizes the importance of him doing that. Isn't it strange that we don't know till later mm-hmm. the impact of everything we do? Yeah. Well, that thing that you sent me, um, <clears throat> it really, it surprised me that someone would be that thoughtful about me. Um, surprised and, you know, <laughs> I was very uh, appreciative of that person's concern. Right, people that you don't even know are listening. Yeah. Well, I've seen it. I've seen her in the chat room, but wow, I did not realize I had made any impact like that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> that was kind of kind of nice for me to see that, and it was a reminder to me: watch your words; they may come back and bite you in your butt. <laughs> <laughs> Not that she said anything that would bite me in the butt, you know, that I, but they reminded me, hey, this person really cares and sees that I really care about everyone out there. Um, so I really have to watch myself. I have to behave. <laughs> it's pretty darn hard to behave for me. Um, no o'clock. <laughs> Dave, I've asked him, and I, I mean, no o'clock time. I have asked him and asked him and asked him. He will not answer that. Okay, okay, just a minute. He is telling me that. Oh, hold on. <clears throat> Okay, it's, all he can say about it is, it, it seems to be a different experience for, for the different peoples, for everyone. Uh, when they, when people come with such a predetermined thought 
about it. It takes a while to deprogram them. <laughs> in some cases. In a lot of cases. Okay. In most cases. <clears throat> because they get a, a certain idea about what it's going to be like when they cross over and make that transition. And, and so they kind of manifest it to be that way until mm, they're they, not comfortably, what's the right word, Dave? They are led gently. Oh, that's it. Okay. He's happy with gently. They're gently taken out of their thought on it and led to what it really is. And he cannot tell us what it really is. So don't ask him anymore. <laughs> so is it a kind of... As Nancy's so fond of saying, reality is what you think it is. On that side, even more than this side. I do believe so. Oh, this poor man that's calling me, he thinks he's calling someone else. He's a really old man. Let me take this just a minute. Okay. I won't. Hello? Hi. I think you have the wrong number you called earlier, too. That's okay. Well, what you dialed so that you know... Um, oh, that's... But it's... No, it's not. Okay. Or it could be 485... Yeah. Well, you're welcome. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Okay. We got that poor little man taken care of. He's so sweet. I just didn't want to let him think he's calling the right number if he really needs something bad. Yeah. So, okay. That's right. Bless his heart. For real, Colleen. (laughs) Um, Mirthling is saying, we so appreciate all. Once I did a fanzine, a publication of any passion, handed first issue to a friend who thought I was only interviewing bands for hoots. Oh, this is for real him and the work to transcribe, etc. Well, I don't know what that means, but... I shared it with Dave. (laughs) He will have to know what that means. Excuse me. Okay, so, you got anything more to say to Dave before I start in on the other stuff? He's going to stick around. He says you don't have to think of it right now. Well... Is it appropriate to wish him a happy birthday? He's thinking about that. He says it, he guesses on this side it would be, but on that side it, it's, uh, it's just another, well actually it's not another day because time is not time. I know, now time is now a clock. <laughs> <clears throat> so, he says thank you. He knows your heartfelt meaning, so he says thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, last week, we decided to do colors, right? Right. In our, in our, uh, what do you call it? Mm. Telepathy. That's it. I knew it started with T, but I couldn't figure. Okay, so I thought of a color, and I will send it again. Okay, I'm going to tell you all what the color is. Let me know if you got it. Blue. Tis blue. 
and we'll see if they what they say and at the end we'll come up with another thing color okay so uh we have been reading i thought it was the color of the cards red or black oh shoot i did i didn't do that I, I didn't think along that line colleen i bet everybody else did too oh shame on me <laughs> well we'll see if anybody <laughs> guessed blue yeah we will that's, I guess that's a really good test. <laughs> Tell them one thing and do another <laughs> and see what they get. <laughs> and now yeah. clock said violet. No, she was close. Yeah. In that range, yeah. And Dottie and I both said red. Okay. Okay. And so did Vanessa. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. You know, I did think red when I went to blue. But that was the last time that ah. I did it. So the time then got violet, red and blue. Yeah. So we're pretty darn freaking right on, really. If they picked up my first thought. Mm, very good. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, okay, anything else before we... Oh, yeah, I forgot, Colleen. This is listener-supported radio stations. Hagee Shack Radio, which is HSR, and Wolf Spirit Radio, WSR. <coughs> so, they have donation buttons on their pages. And... uh if you can, please donate. All your donations go toward the running of the station. The hosts, the guests, the producers, <laughs> um, the people who take care of the forums. None of those people get any money. It just, and I'm thinking it should in some cases, but hey, who am I to think stuff? <clears throat> any Any materials that are used, I think, should be covered. By the donations, but that's my thought, folks. And, and things like electricity should be covered because without electricity, uh, Colleen couldn't run the station. She couldn't produce for us and JP couldn't either. So I don't know if they do it for that or not, but that's what it would go toward. And, uh, we have archives, which are free for the first week. And then after that first week, you go into subscription mode where you pay $5 a month. And you will have to renew that $5 each month. Um, you'll get an email reminder in telling you that your time for the archives is about to expire. So if you want to <clears throat> renew it, go ahead and do it. And we love questions and comments, so if you have any, please be sure to put them in all caps in the chat room, because that will get our attention and let us know you're not just chit-chatting with each other. (coughs) Okay, so we're reading How Enlightenment Changes Your Brain, The New Science of Transformation by Dr. Andrew Nur. Newberg and Mark Robert Waldman. Okay. I need to get a drink. Hold on. Alrighty. <clears throat> so we have gotten to the place right your way to enlightenment and that is W-R-I-T-E. Hold on just a minute. Okie dokie. And uh, I'll take this time to remind everyone that Saturday... Oh, Colleen. What? I I was on mute. Oh, I thought you were, like, called away on something or... Oh, jeez, I am so sorry. I've been talking up a storm and telling them... Oh, I could just... 
that bitch. Dave thinks it's funny. It's not funny. Well, we used to laugh at him. <laughs> or holler at him. Unmute your mic, Dave. <laughs> so you didn't hear anything about um the donation or the Oh yeah, that? we heard you know, we're listener supported and okay. uh, and and talking about the electricity and all of that and then you went silent. I thought hmm. And you know what? I didn't even hit it myself. Dave <laughs> He said he didn't do it. <laughs> crosses, crosses non-existent heart. He didn't do it. <laughs> okay. So you heard about the archive, right? I'm not sure we heard about the archives. Yes, 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 maybe. <laughs> okay, well, they know about the archives. $5 a month after the first free week, you guys. <laughs> If you have questions or comments, please put them in all caps in the chat room so that we know you're talking to us. I think that's all I was supposed to do. Oh, yeah. And then I said, we are reading How Enlightenment Changes Your Brain, The New Science of Transformation by Dr. Andrew Newberg and Mark Robert Waldman. And we were last week... Uh, reading about the different enlightenment things, like um, hold on, I'm trying to trying to get wisdom from the dead, and we did inside the brain of a media. <laughs> Just a minute, seriously. <laughs> Okay, I have to reread Wisdom from the Dead (laughs) to make somebody happy. (laughs) All right. Can trance states, which supposedly connect a person to the spirits of the dead, provide a path toward enlightenment, the Big E, or at least shed some light on what the Big E enlightenment is? We think so. A few years ago, a Brazilian friend of mine Julio Perez, who is a researcher in psychology, began studying a group of highly educated mediums who practice a technique called psychography. To perform psychography, the medium enters into a trance state and connects to the spirits of the dead. The spirits provide information which the medium automatically writes down. During these sessions, the mediums do not feel like they are guiding their own hands. Rather, it is the spirits who are causing their hands to move. The mediums then share their information with friends and family members of the deceased. Interestingly, a triple-blind study conducted at the University of Arizona showed that the mediums they tested were more likely to give accurate information about the deceased than those relatives who were not mediums. The mediums were able to identify more aspects of the deceased relative in terms of physical appearance, personality, hobbies, and the cause of death. For over a 100 years, Mediumship has been very popular in Brazil, and I was very interested to see what was occurring in the brains of these psychographers. Would their scans look like activities we found in mediators or Pentecostals or some completely new pattern? I was also interested to know how the practice of being a medium affected their lives. Mediumship can be traced back to the Book of Simon in the Jewish Bible. However, many critics view most mediums as charlatans, especially since so many have been exposed as frauds by various law enforcement groups. Other critics consider the practitioners delusional, but the research disagrees. For example, a recent study of 115 spirit mediums found that they had a low prevalence of psychiatric disorders and were well adjusted socially compared with the general population. Clearly their trance states 
were distinct from disassociative identity disorder, and many psychologists now recognize that such practices can be a part can be part of a legitimate spiritual practice. Other researchers have compared to trance the trance states of mediums to self-induced hypnotic techniques that allow a person to access subconscious thoughts or feelings. Hypnosis, however, involves increased activity in the frontal lobe and is accompanied by a perceived sense of increased awareness. In the trance states I have studied, we actually see a decrease in frontal activity associated with a partial loss of consciousness. <clears throat> the psychographers reminded me of the famous psychic Edgar Casey, who by 1912 was world renowned for his ability to enter trance states to gain knowledge about a person's illness and what remedies could be used. I wondered what types of brain changes might be happening in his brain. People called him the sleeping prophet. And when Casey would awaken from his trances, he'd have no memory of what he said. But while he was in trance, a strange voice would emanate from him, which his assistants would record. This is similar to the Pentecostal practice of speaking in tongues, where frontal lobe activity also decreased. Setting aside the question of actual psychic ability, trance states deserve special attention because they appear to measurably enhance spirituality and life satisfaction in people who consciously choose to elicit them. For this reason, I created a research protocol to shed more light on the practice of mediumship. What we found was an incredibly healthy group of individuals who provided a valued service to their community. We published our brain scan findings in peer-reviewed journal in 2012. You want me to read this too? Well, Dave. All right, I'll read it. Inside the brain of a medium. This is a new section. <clears throat> Neuroscience cannot truly test whether a psychic or a medium is actually connecting to the spirit world. But we can explore what happens in the brain when the medium enters these unusual states of consciousness. We can then compare these changes to other spiritual practices and also identify potential health benefits. We devised an experiment using single photon emission computed tomography, in other words, SPECT, SPECT, to measure different regions of the brain. When certain areas become more active, there is increased blood flow. And if that occurs in the frontal lobe, for instance, your decision-making skills increase. If it occurs in the parietal lobe, your conscious awareness of yourself may increase. If it occurs in the amygdala, you might feel suddenly fearful. And if it occurs in the thalamus, we believe that the event you are experiencing will feel more real and intense. To do a SPECT scan, we start by placing a small intravenous catheter in your arm. Then while you are performing a particular activity, in this case entering a trance state, we inject a small amount of radioactive tracer that quickly travels to the most active areas in your brain. These tracers are generally considered quite harmless since the several nanograms of material are so important. Okay, that was my opinion of it. So they give you a little at a time. It adds up. My opinion there. Importantly, once the tracer gets to the active part of the brain, it stays there. So after you've completed the activity, for example, prayer or psycho- psychography, we want to measure the trance state in this case. We'll take you down the hall to our spec 
camera and literally take a picture of your, what your brain was doing at that moment. For our trance study, my friend flew up a group of expert practitioners of psychography from Brazil. When I met these mediums, they were extremely gracious and pleasant. They were very excited about being part of the study, and several of the mediums said that they had already received messages from the spirit world encouraging their participation. Right before we started, one of the senior members of the group commented that there was a male spirit who was near my head and who was a family member, an uncle on my father's side of the family. I was told that the name of the spirit was Joseph and that this spirit was very interested in the research I was doing. When I returned home that day, I immediately called my father to ask him if we had any uncles named Joseph who had died. We did. Now Joseph is a very common name, but the notion that maybe the medium actually contacted someone excited me. (laughs) He's testing mediums, but he doesn't believe them, evidently. I thought that if great Uncle Joe was interested in my research on spiritual experiences, maybe he was a particularly spiritual person, perhaps a rabbi. Oh, my gosh. That's where my imagination took me. But when my father said that Joseph was an accountant, I felt disappointed. After all, why would an accountant care about a brain study of this type? Maybe he was a particularly spiritual accountant. (laughs) We may never know, but I share this story because many research studies show that there are parts of the brain that have no problem believing in spiritual, supernatural powers. Okay. Well, I think they already know that. Oh, right, I'll tell them. Um, That's the end of that section about the medium stuff. And Dave wants me to share with you how I hear spirits like he, he is. How I hear, I can't say people because he's a spirit now. So how I hear spirits. Um, I don't go into a trance. Uh, I don't lose consciousness. Uh, I have gotten to where I can feel him coming and he comes down the back of the house into the back room through that window over there and I can feel him coming and then when he comes through that window I really get the feel of him my my hair stand up and and I get goosebumps and I know he's here of course he comes in rather (laughs) loudly (laughs) well you do (laughs) Okay, and so I hear him immediately when he when he talks with me. It's to me in my mediumship experiences. It's as if there's a a real a live human on this side standing there talking to me. Sometimes I see them, but I don't see. Well, once in a great while, I'll see them as if they're in a human body. Most of the time, I see, hear them is how I say it. I can, I can see a form that, that takes shape as much as it can, but yet it's still floaty like a human, but yet it's still, it's not defined human features or anything, or, or the defined human form. It just has a, a floaty, it just looks like a floaty form of a human. And when I hear them, I don't know how to say it, Dave. 
Oh, he says, just say you hear them in your head. You feel them in your heart. And you know in your soul that they're there. Oh, that's a heck of a way. Yes, 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 yes. Dave said it. Say it to me again. I feel them in my head. I feel them in my heart and I know in my soul that they're there. And it doesn't matter to me if people say they're not because I'm over that. Oh, maybe I'm not hearing. Because I finally have come to the point where, yeah, I know I'm hearing them. Is that okay? All right. He's happy. He wanted you all to hear about the mediums again in the book. And he wanted me to share my experience. And he says to tell you that sometimes I can't perceive what the Spirit is trying to get across to me because of my human frailty. (laughs) All right. (laughs) He says that's the only way you can say it where everyone will understand. Um. And when people go away from a reading and they think, oh, that was just all hogwash. He says, for me, you better believe it because he says I'm the real thing. Well, geez, Dave, thanks. And he says once they get away and after a while that all of a sudden what I said hits them and then they say, oh, that's what she meant. That's what she was talking about. So he says, keep it up. He wants me to keep it up, and he wants you all to believe it. It really is true. Okay. Now the next section, can I move on? Okay, I can move on. The next section was when the spirit moves you, and then we came to, that was a big section, flowing, F-L-O-W-I-N-G, in parentheses, toward the big E enlightenment. And then we get to the right, W-R-I-T-E, your way to enlightenment. And now, I don't know if I read that, Dave. Okay, he says, start from there like I'm starting for the day. Okay. Another interesting finding arose from our research on automatic writing. My Brazilian colleagues analyzed what was actually written during the psychography practice and during normal writing. The results showed that the written content was much more complex during psychography. This is fascinating because you would think that more complex writing would require more activity in the usual language areas. But somehow the experienced mediums were able to produce more richness and variation, much like how a great poet composes a line of verse, even without the usual language areas. So maybe there is really some type of external communication, communication in parentheses, going to these people. Of course, even if this were the case, it does not mean that it came from dead spirits. Perhaps they are simply picking up on information coming from other people around them. While psychography alters consciousness and affects the brain in unique ways, we would not say that automatic writing, in and of itself, was a form of enlightenment especially since the practice did not change the medium's belief system. Perhaps their first experience may have changed their life and started them down a new path, but it is possible that the practice of automatic writing can help to open up our consciousness to new ways of thinking, ultimately leading to the big E enlightenment. In other words, it may prime the pump through the little E experiences. We have tried to learn from our studies what types of practices can produce the greatest changes in the brain, specifically the big drops in frontal frontal lobe activity that interpret habitual states of consciousness and lead to a sense of surrendering oneself. 
Practices like psychography or speaking in tongues can stimulate unique circuits in the brain that give one the power to channel information from what feels like different entities or sources of inspiration. Whether such experiences are purely created by brain activity or actually come from a spiritual dimension, science cannot say. But the research is definitive. Any experience, if it brings enough clarity to change our behavior or beliefs, can lead to the little E or the big E moment of insight. If you would like to experience automatic writing now, go grab a pen and some paper and try this experiment. Okay, well, well, those of you who want to do it right now, go grab a pen and paper. I'm going to have a drink here. And I'm going to take a peek on what Mirthling said. Check out Neil Slade Brain Magic. Tickle your amygdala. I don't know how to say that right. Amygdala. It's probably all wrong, but that's the best I can do. Okay. We're going to get to step one. First, write down the first thought that comes to mind. Anything. Congratulations, you just wrote from your normal state of consciousness. Level three in our spectrum model. Oh yeah, remember that model where they had the different things? Step two. Now take a moment to recall a time when you were filled with anger or rage. Fill yourself with that feeling and then write down whatever comes to mind using whatever expletives you'd like. Now think about something that made you feel very sad. Immerse yourself in that feeling and write down the words that automatically come to mind. You've just accessed the best one can the first level of instinctual emotional awareness described in our spectrum of human awareness. Step three. Now for the fun part. Write down the craziest sentence you can think of. Imagine that you are lunatic or stoned or drunk and write down something ridiculous. For example, there's an elephant wearing a diaper sitting in my refrigerator. (laughs) I'll give you a few minutes to write that down. (laughs) A few seconds. Thank goodness it's wearing a diaper. (laughs) If it's going to be in my refrigerator. (laughs) I can picture these things. I get the biggest kick because I... Have such an imagination. Don't eat the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have any chocolate in there. I need chocolate. <laughs> well, if the elephant wasn't wearing a diaper. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> okay, Van says amygdala. Amygdala. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Okay, now keep writing down crazy, wild, silly sentences until you feel a sense of abandonment. So they want you to go nuts with it, guys. If you're writing down, just go nuts with your imagination. It doesn't matter if you scribble gibberish or make up meaningless words. You are now exercising level four, creative imagination. This, by the way, is a common warm-up exercise used by many writers to break through writer's block. Step four. Take ten very deep breaths or run in place as fast as you can for 30 seconds. That sounds like an awful lot of work. I already ran on the treadmill today 20 minutes. This is a quick way to interrupt everyday consciousness and prepare your mind for automatic writing. Next, just sit quietly for a moment and watch your thoughts and feelings ramble through your conscious mind. 
This is the first stage of level five, self-reflective awareness. Now think about an issue or problem you're currently struggling with and imagine that you are someone else, the world's greatest problem solver, like Freud or Einstein or Harry Potter, and begin to write a response to your problem as if you were that other person. Write down whatever comes to mind without censorship. Trust your intuition and be as inventive or silly as you like in one or two paragraphs. Well, I'm not going to wait for one or two paragraphs. You can do that. Then just gaze at what you wrote, staying deeply relaxed and observant. Ask your intuition to provide a new insight into your problem. You'll often be surprised as you receive a glimmer of inner wisdom that seems to come from nowhere. That's the beginning of level six, where personal transformation begins. After a bit of practice, you may discover that automatic writing can help you solve problems better than normal journaling can. One study found that doing a creative writing exercise like this one was particularly effective for processing feelings of grief. Another study conducted at Carnegie Mellon University found that creative writing can interrupt negative thoughts and depressive symptoms, whereas normal writing had no such effect. Interestingly, as with the mediums, researchers found decreases in the language centers of expert creative writers. So if you really want to pursue a path toward the Big E Enlightenment, the answer is simple. Keep practicing. (laughs) Okay, we're ready for Chapter 7, Changing the Consciousness of Others. Let me take a little peek here. Okie doke. And I need to change my position. My old creaky bones are really kind of creaky today. Oh, I need oiled. (laughs) Dick said he'd be happy to oil my joints for me. (laughs) And he pulled out this big... Big oil can, you know, the old-fashioned kind. Like with, Wizard of Oz? Yes. <laughs> what a nut. <laughs> okay, Chapter 7, Changing the Consciousness of Others. When people have profound experiences that change their life and world view, they usually want to share their insights and wisdom with others. Even if the experience itself is difficult to put into words, history is filled with the teachings of the little E enlightened individuals. Even in Plato's allegory of the cave, the message is clear. If you have seen the light... If you have ventured from the darkness of ignorance and now see reality for what it is, really, you must return to your companions in the cave and pass your knowledge on to them. In this chapter, we're going to explore one of the most esoteric forms of communication that relates to the power of our silent thoughts to influence others. Ooh, here we go. In the East, the ability to silently pass wisdom from the master to the student was called Dharma transmission. That's D-H-A-R-M-A. Which could result in sudden biggie enlightenment. The concept was popularized in the 17th century when the Buddhist monasteries and traditions were under severe political attack and it continued to be practiced as a way to identify the lineage of revered teachers and gurus. Today, the practice of enlightening others just through the gaze of the master is sometimes called... Oh, of course it is. Dave. Shaktipat. S-H-A-K-T-I-P-A-T. 
Shack de Pat. <laughs> he says I'm close. No cookie. <laughs> okay. Oh, hey, I see big letters in here. Hold on. Mirthling Julia Cameron, the artist way morning pages. Okay. I don't remember what what's referred to there. Oh, it's a great book. Okay. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. This is a new section called Can Thoughts Heal? In the West, the notion that one's thoughts could influence others was a foreign concept, often associated with witchcraft, sorcery, or brainwashing. When it came to spiritual enlightenment, Most Western religions believed that God was the only bestower of such wisdom. (laughs) Stop. Dave says, they'd have trouble with my brain to brainwash it because it works in a different way. (laughs) Okay. A good way, he says, a good way. (laughs) Thank you. However, one could petition God with one's thoughts through prayer. And if you wanted someone to be healed, you had to go through God or the head of the religious organization. All of that changed in the late 1800s, thanks to the influence of Mary Baker Eddy and her Christian science movement. Eddy had been a patient of Phineas Quimby, a man who believed that all illness was caused by the mind, and she began to integrate a wide variety of metaphysical healing strategies with biblical passages. The result? Many people came to believe that they could directly tap into God's divine power to heal others who were suffering or ill. According to mainstream Christianity, this was almost heretical. 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 Thank you. I couldn't get the right emphasis. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Because God was taken out of the equation. However, the Christian scientists believed that everyone could be enlightened by the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost and directly transmit healing powers to others. Mental healing became the new form of prayer, and it rapidly spread through America, giving birth to dozens of churches who viewed God, consciousness, the mind, and the universe as one and the same. Eastern and Western notions of the Big E Enlightenment were finally united, and the belief that thoughts could heal other people at a distance now has hundreds of millions of believers throughout the world. But can silent thoughts really heal? Scientific studies on intercessory prayer, the ability to affect another person's health from a distance, have been conducted for many years. When you look at the early studies, the evidence was positive. People in hospitals who were being anonymously prayed for were healing a few days faster and being released from the hospital a few days earlier. And it was shown to help coronary care patients and patients suffering from arthritis. But beginning in 2001, as more studies were conducted around the world, the benefit claims began to disappear. Intercessory prayer had no effect on those who suffered from alcohol abuse, child psychiatric disorders, and immune disorders, or on the healing of wounds or the health of pregnant women. Nor was there any effect on the growth of cultured human brain cells, although the study did show that a mechanical random number generator was affected. Some studies even showed that those who knew they were being prayed for had the, had more problems and complications than those who were not prayed over. Another study found that those who believed in prayer did better, and those who didn't believe showed no improvement of symptoms. Still, other researchers suggested that when active prayer was integrated into, doc, into the 
doctor-patient relationships, it could strengthen the patient's optimism and activate the body's healing resources. In countries like Brazil and Puerto Rico, where mediums are an accepted part of the treatment in mental health facilities, the patients report many benefits. I'm sorry, I'm listening to Dave. He's saying that, yes, uh, prayers definitely help. Whether you believe it or not, prayers help. But the person who is receiving is helped additionally when they do believe in that there is God, a source, the main guy, whatever you want to call him. Thanks, Dave. What is going on? Do our healing thoughts have any effect on others? Or worse, can our prayers actually cause harm? These are more, these are important scientific, medical and ethical issues to address. Certainly a person's belief system plays a major role in these experiments. For example, in 2014, when Ankara, Ankara University researchers in Turkey measured the therapeutic effects of Islamic intercess- intercessory prayer on Muslims infected with warts, they found significant improvements in patients who trusted the person sending the prayers, but saw no effect at all in patients who did not. Here's what the research shows. If you believe that prayer heals, that alone can stimulate the immune system. But if you don't know if you are being prayed for, there is no convincing evidence showing that thoughts at a distance have an effect. A recent brain imaging study made a remarkable discovery. A group of subjects, half of which were were devoted Christians and half who were secular, was studied with fMRI while listening to a series of recorded prayers. The subjects were told that the prayers being said were by either a non-Christian, an ordinary Christian, or a Christian with healing powers. However, the prayers were all being said by the same male speaker, a Christian who did not belong to any charismatic group. When the devoted Christian subjects, who were mainly Pentecostal, listened to the prayers they believed were coming from a Christian endowed with healing powers, activity in their frontal lobe decreased. Based on our trance state research and our neurological model of enlightenment, this suggests that believers can enter a state of consciousness where healing powers feel utterly real. However, our research does not show that healing prayers stimulate any form of insights that could lead to the lily enlightenment experiences. In a research study I recently conducted, in which I'll talk about in more detail in a moment, I tested a distinguished healer's ability to influence a person's brain when she was in an adjoining room. As far as we could see, nothing happened. When I scanned the healer's brain, I found changes similar to other medication meditation studies. Frontal lobe activity went up, suggesting that there were physical and mental beliefs for the healer, but not for the person being prayed for. This strongly suggests you must deliberately seek the biggie enlightenment for yourself by actively engaging in processes that will interrupt your normal way of thinking and experiencing reality. Um, We're ready to start another section, but this is a good time to take a break. Perfect timing. Yeah. All righty. I've got Under the Trees of Hope by Andreas Wolenweider. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, that one that Walt sent. Yes, he sends me those by this fellow. And I never remember how to pronounce that last <laughs> name. But it's always good music, so. <laughs> good. How long? Four minutes and 11 seconds. Oh, pretty. Okay. Okay. Are we back? We are back. Okay. Dave and I were carrying on a conversation. <laughs> I, it's, it's nice having him sit here again with us. It's been a while since he came to sit. Right. Usually it's like in and out. Boom. Yeah. He says, well, I've been busy. There's lots of stuff going on. Oh, there is, and I'd love to talk to you about it. <laughs> He's waving his finger back and forth. No, no, no. <laughs> You'll see when it happens. Well, I don't want to see when it happens. I want somebody to tell me right now. Can we believe Taryn? Yes, you can believe what Taryn says. Not to the letter, but he has the gist of the story. And he says, yes, Vanessa, you're going to get your new body. (laughs) Okay, let me get back to the book, Dave. All right, here's a new section called Paranormal Events Really Happen. In religious literature from around the world, many enlightened people are said to have gained special powers as a result of their personal transformation. In our online survey, we asked our respondents if they believed they had developed any unusual capabilities as the result of their spiritual epiphanies, and 10% claimed to experience telepathy, telekinesis, clairvoyance or the oh, excuse me or the ability uh, where I lost my place just like oh there we go or the ability to communicate with the spirit world but does the biggie enlightenment actually endow people with special powers and can we even study whether or not supernatural abilities truly exist Hold on, I saw capital letters in there. I told you what Dave said, so I don't have to again. Psychology is the study of how thoughts, prayers, consciousness, or human energy, in uh, parentheses, energy, can influence other people or objects. It also includes the study of psychic, or psi, P- PSI, phenomena such as telepathy, such as telepathy, precognition, clairvoyance, near-death experiences, reincarnation, mediumship, and other paranormal claims. In spite of the generally negative view that most scientists have on such research, there are a number of well-designed studies showing consistently positive results that people can actually affect other objects at a distance. Although the effects are very small, often less than 1%, these studies indicate that the results are better than chance. For example, researchers at the University of Missouri analyzed the data from hundreds of PSI, psi phenomena studies, and came to this conclusion. We find that the evidence, dot, 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 favors the existence of psi by a factor of about 6 billion to 1, which is noteworthy even for a skeptical reader. In a different multi-university study published in 2014, researchers analyzed seven independent studies showing that the human body can apparently detect random stimuli 1 to 10 seconds before the images or sounds are actually presented to the person. For example, when people were randomly shown pleasant and unpleasant photos, their bodies reacted to the unpleasant images 
before the picture was shown to them. This ability to feel the future, even when the person was not consciously aware of it, appears to be a form of precognition that we can actually measure in a neuroimaging lab. Even though we don't seem to be conscious of this precognitive capacity, it may help us to deal with emergency and crisis situations. Evidence suggests that everyday consciousness, which is level three in our spectrum model, is rather slow especially compared to other systems in our brain. Furthermore, the intuitive processes in our brain are much faster than our conscious ability to rationally think. The areas that generate intuition are located in the insula and interior, anterior, cingulate cortex and they contribute to our ability to understand the world in more global and comprehensive ways. Intuitive awareness, level five, is not language-oriented, but it helps to inform our frontal lobe consciousness when it comes to moral and ethical issues. Uh, this intuitive awareness is also part of the scientific process, where seemingly spontaneous realizations have given researchers the tools to understand the nature of DNA, gravity, geometry, and relativity. As Einstein once said, the intellect has little to do on the road to discovery. There comes a leap in consciousness, call it intuition or what you will, and the solution comes to you, and you do not know how or why. All great discoveries are made in this way. We suggest that the biggie enlightenment shows a person that there is more to life than our intellect can see, and by interrupting our normal consciousness, reflecting on the creative levels of awareness that exist inside us, we can change our entire view of reality. This is where transformation occurs, whether it is a tiny insight or an aha experience or a grand shift of awareness brought about through the experience of the Big E Enlightenment. New section called Tony Robbins and the Oneness Blessing. Personally, I am fascinated by the possibility that consciousness could affect something at a distance, and it would certainly add a new quality to our description of the Big E Enlightenment. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to do an experiment involving this concept with Tony Robbins, the well-known motivational speaker. It was exciting to meet him, his wife, and his small dog, and I had a lot of fun getting to know them. Tony had become interested in a practice called the Oneness Blessing, a derivative, I can't, why can't I say that? Derivation, D-E-R-I-V-A-T-I-O-N. I know how to say that, but I can't say it right now. Of a Hindu spiritual tradition known as Shaktipat. Now, if I'm saying that wrong, please, guys, let me know. What? Oh, (laughs) okay. She scared me for a minute. (laughs) I saw 911. She was referring to something else. Colleen says, if I ran in place for 30 seconds, the only thing I could think is call 911. I don't know. I I don't run. I just walk on the treadmill. So I can understand that. Okay, so Tony had become interested in a practice called the oneness blessing. A derivation, ah, that word again, of a Hindu spiritual tradition known as Shaktipat. 
where wisdom and energy are directly transmitted from an enlightened teacher into the consciousness of a student. Once enlightened, you are then empowered to bestow the blessing on others. Tony offered to give me and a few others the oneness blessing. I went up to the Four Seasons Hotel in New York City, where a suite had been set up for about 15 people to receive the blessing. Tony instructed us to find a comfortable position to sit in and to keep our eyes closed throughout the ceremony. It began with soft, meditative-like music, and we were asked to concentrate on our breath, paying attention as we slowly inhaled and exhaled, relaxing our bodies and minds. After about 15 minutes, several people who were considered givers walked up to us and placed their hands over our heart and on our head. You could feel their hands vibrating as they transmitted the blessing to us, but not a word was uttered. This was done about three or four times during the ceremony, each time lasting about 60 seconds. Then we were told to slowly open our eyes and bring our consciousness back to the present moment. I actually had a surprising experience. Although my eyes were closed the entire time, when I was touched for the first time, a strong light came in through my eyelids. Imagine being in a darkened room and somebody suddenly shines a flashlight in your face while you keep your eyes shut. That's exactly what I experienced. It made me think of the many descriptions of the Biggie Enlightenment in which people perceived a powerfully bright and beautiful light. While I did not have that type of intense experience, there were similarities. Now it's possible that the sun had simply come out from the behind, had simply come out from behind a cloud, making the room brighter. But with my eyes closed, I couldn't tell if I imagined it or if it was related to the oneness blessing. I've never had that kind of visual experience again, so it's difficult for me to judge it. But I certainly was intrigued enough to set up a neuroimaging experiment. Hold on. I wanted to see what was going on in the brains of both people involved in the oneness blessing, the sender and the receiver. Nothing like this had ever been done before, and I was very excited to see what the scans would show. Would they be similar to our scans with the Buddhists and nuns, or would the brain look more like the mediums and Pentecostals who entered into trance states? Or would there be some other pattern, perhaps one more specifically related to the Little E Enlightenment? But I faced a problem. How do you set up a control situation where the receiver can't tell if a blessing is being given or not? Obviously, if someone puts a vibrating hand on you, you'd know they were doing something. If I could figure out a way to blind the study, where the receiver couldn't tell when the energy transmission was taking place, I could see if there was different neurological activity associated with the oneness blessing. Then we could say that something had been transmitted from one person to another. An interesting possibility came to light. Several of the practitioners informed me that the blessing could be given without actually being in physical contact with the other person. In fact, they said that I could put the receiver in a completely different room. That not only solved my problem, it provided a scientific opportunity to see whether a person's intention might influence the brain of another person at a distance. I placed a small intravenous catheter in the arms of both a sender and receiver. Since they were in different rooms, all I had to do was inject the blood flow tracer into both of them at the moment when the oneness blessing was given. We made sure that the giver and receiver had no contact with each other prior to the study, but we gave the sender the person's picture, name, and location in the building. 
We told the receiver that we would conduct two sessions in random order. One would be the control or resting condition, and the other would be the actual transmission of the blessing. From the receiver's vantage point, there would be no way to know when the actual blessing was sent. By using this SPECT protocol, as we did with the Brazilian mediums, we could see the before and after pictures of the givers and receivers' brains. If we found a difference, it would lend evidence to the possibility that some form of transmission or enlightenment took place. And they have a picture here with two brains. And it says, figure two, SPECT scan from a receiver showing increased activity, arrow pointing to the darker region in the thalamus. And um, it kind of looks like a squished circle, like a heart that is squished together. In the second picture, but in the first picture, the right side of that uh, elongates at the bottom, so it doesn't quite look like a heart, but it has a middle-type division in it. So it did make a difference in the pictures they took. New section called The Power of Sending Blessings. I know, but I didn't know how else to say it. Dave said I did a pretty piss poor explanation of it. I'm sorry, but I don't know how else to tell you all. Okay, the new section, the power of sending blessings. So what did we find? Normally, mentally concentrating on another person would increase activity in the frontal lobe. But sending the oneness blessing actually decreased frontal activity in the senders a pattern very similar to what we observed in the Brazilian mediums and Pentecostals who spoke in tongues. The givers described their experience not as concentrating directly on their receivers, but as surrendering to the power behind the blessing, allowing that energy to flow through them to another individual. Unlike the Pentecostals and mediums, We also saw decreases in the parietal lobe. Thus, their sense of self would dissolve as the divine energy of the biggie enlightenment flowed through them. We saw similar parietal lobe decreases when people engaged in deep prayer for close to an hour. At that moment, the nuns felt as though they were in the presence of God or Jesus, and the Buddhists felt that they had merged with pure consciousness and their sense of self would disappear. Perhaps the same thing happens while giving the blessing. The practitioner's self disappears, and only the spiritual energy, the shaktipat, remains. But we could not say whether or not the senders experienced the biggie enlightenment as they gave the blessing. Like the mediums, their belief system did not change. But perhaps it had when they initially received the blessing that turned them into people who now felt deeply connected with the oneness blessing. New section called the powerlessness of receiving blessing. But what happened to the receivers? This, for me, was the bigger question, with far bigger stakes. Well, the results certainly were not impressive. When we asked the receivers which session they thought was the blessing, only 50% guessed correctly. Statistically, that's pure chance. No better than flip a coin. However... Even if the people couldn't tell if they received energy from another person, I wondered if there might be value for the recipient. When I looked at the brain scans, I found a few areas that were statistically different between the control condition and the oneness blessing condition. Activity in the right caudate and right Hippocampus areas involved with memory and abstract thought 
decreased between 10 to 15 percent. So it's possible that these structures located in the deeper limbic areas of the brain might be affected by the oneness blessing. But if the recipient can't detect anything, how do we know if these subtle brain changes mean anything? Obviously, the receiver didn't feel any of the qualities associated with the enlightenment. Intensity, clarity, unity, surrender, or a change in belief. Nor did the receiver feel a sense of pleasure that would reflect changes of activity in the emotional areas of the brain. Something a person would expect to experience if enlightenment was actually transferred to her. Interestingly, activity in the thalamus increased in the receivers during the oneness blessing. As we have described before, this structure is involved with sensory perception and it also relays information back and forth between the consciousness centers of the frontal lobe and the rest of the brain. So what was stimulating the thalamus? Perhaps there are subtle energies or sensations that our brain perceives, but which never enter into our conscious mind. Given the fact that we only had a small group of people and that the magnitude of the changes we recorded were very small, it is difficult to draw any firm conclusions from this experiment. Boy, that must have been frustrating for them. i got to change position again. Sorry, guys. Oh. All right. New section, change the consciousness of yourself. Yes, I would appreciate that. Dave said, does he want me to rub my back where it hurts? And I said, yes. Please. Oh. Well, I feel the energy. I don't know about these people they're testing, but... Oh, my gosh, yes. It's... Oh, thank you, Dave. Thank you. I can breathe again without pain. (laughs) Given the various qualities ascribed to a a big enlightenment experience, feelings of unity, bliss, or transcendent insights, none of the recipients of the oneness blessing reported any unusual thoughts, images, or feelings. Over here. Yeah. But perhaps it doesn't matter if consciousness can truly extend beyond the confines of the brain. What is more important, in my opinion, is whether the experience is perceived as positive or negative, beneficial or disruptive. What we found throughout all of our studies is that most people feel that their spiritual practices add great meaning and purpose to their life. Without a sense of meaning and purpose in life, we are far more prone to anxiety and depression. This is especially true for adolescents. For as psychologists at the University of South Florida found, a sense of purpose enhances coping, generosity, optimism, humility, mature identity status, and more global personality integration. With the rise of the knowns, N-O-N-E-S, a term used to identify adults and the larger and the large percentage of youth who have turned away from mainstream religion and spirituality, we need to find new tools and experiences to enlighten the minds of the next generation of seekers. Oh, thank you, Dave, thank you. I am feeling much enlightened myself, the bit little Okay. We may not be able to instantly enlighten others with our hands or silent thoughts, but we 
but we can build belief systems that are filled with optimism, curiosity, open-mindedness, and desire to transcend the veils of ignorance. Practices such as meditation, mindfulness, yoga, or deep contemplative prayer, as the vast majority of the research has shown, help us to better regulate our emotions and increase our empathy and compassion for others. This message is clear. Focus on changing the consciousness of yourself, and personal growth will occur. This might not fit the Eastern concepts of the Biggie Enlightenment, but it clearly reflects the Western notion exemplified by the Age of Enlightenment where intense self-reflection would lead to the discovery of rational and scientific truth. One final thought on the oneness blessing. We know that face-to-face interactions have a more powerful effect on the brain. Perhaps the hand-to-body contact used by spiritual healers functions in a similar way. Of the hundreds of studies conducted on healing, touch, and various energy therapies as they are referred to in the complementary medicine field many have found decreases in a patient's anxiety, stress and pain but again the reach is ambiguous with many other studies finding no statistical significance the reason however may be simple the most beneficial changes are associated with practices where the patient becomes an active participant in her own healing ritual. The solution, then, is equally simple. Create your own spiritual practice combining any technique you find pleasant, stimulating, and meaningful. And if you bring your personal, relational, and spiritual values into the words you speak and the actions you take with others, that, in my opinion, is the profile of a big E enlightenment, enlightened individual. And I think Dave just pointed out how energies, healing energies even, can be passed, even from the spiritual world to the human world. My back was killing me. I mean, it was hurting bad, guys. And when he did whatever he did, holy cow, my body feels all tingly. All all of my body feels tingly, even even my hairs. (laughs) And I feel my back is, is, it doesn't hurt anymore. So he gave us a living example. Thank you, Dave. He says he's enjoying being here. Mm. I can't express to you how much better I feel, you guys. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dave. Chapter 8, Opening the Heart to Unity. Mm. Let me just enjoy this a second. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I love the tingling sensation. Okay, it was 8 p.m. and a small breeze filtered through the Big Sur Mountains situated on the northern California coast. A group of about 25 people were about to engage in a little-known Sufi ritual called... Here's that dicker word... (laughs) I don't know how else to say it, Colleen, than Dicker. Oh, yeah, Dicker. (laughs) Yeah, Dicker has a whole other meaning. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know how to say it other than that. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Oh, and it says sometimes spelled Zikar and pronounced, oh, listen to this, and pronounced Zikar. Oh, Zikar. With a soft Z. How do you say a soft Z? I only know one way to say Z. Is a soft a Z and S? <laughs> I don't know. A sicker? 
A thicker? <laughs> <laughs> and we're going from bad to worse with this word. <laughs> thicker. <laughs> I better read that one. <laughs> a group of about 25 people were about to engage in a little-known Sufi ritual called Dakar, as Colleen says, sometimes spelled Z-H-I-K-R and pronounced Zikr with a soft Z. Uh, maybe it's instead of car, if it's I-R, it might be ear, like Zikir. Oh, yeah, the pronunciation on the different spot. Yeah. Yeah, Zikir. We'll try to say it that way so we don't sound... I uh, know, I know, reading Dr. Rita's book, I've just been tripping all over the words. (laughs) (laughs) Because she's talking uh, all sorts of different languages, including alien types, names and things. Mm. And it's been quite the challenge. Anyway, now I'll shut up and let you continue. <laughs> That's, I enjoy your talking with me. Okay. Sufism is a mystical branch of Islam that focuses on divine love, unity, and enlightenment. The class divided into three groups. The first group sat with their backs against the wall of the room. Their task was to rhythmically clap their hands or tap on a variety of drums, while the second group formed a large circle. They would chant, Oh, you got to be kidding me. They would chant, Lay, Ileha, Ileha, Leha, Lay, La. Oh, whatever. It sounds something like that which roughly translates as, there is no God but God. It's an invocation of the oneness of everything and an invitation to open one's heart to the direct experience of God's love. While chanting, (laughs) they would also rock their heads from side to side. Dave, wasn't that funny? (laughs) He's cracking up. I try. (laughs) The third group gathered in the center of the circle to practice the dervish ritual of whirling, a ceremony created in 1273 by the Mevlevi Sufis, located in Turkey. Those who would be whirling stood with one arm stretched upward and the other toward the ground and they would begin to slowly turn in a circle as the outer group began to chant, clap, and drum. As the speed of the drums increased, the chanters raised their voices and deepened the rocking of their head and torso. Those in the center who were whirling went faster and faster. Such movements have powerful effects on the brain, and the rhythmic elements stimulate the autonomic nervous system, activating reward areas of the brain associated with strong positive emotions. It would uh, invoke puking in my case. (laughs) Kevin was one of the participants in the outer circle who were chanting and rocking. He was a 48-year-old man who wavered between agnosticism and atheism, but he loved to explore the rituals of different religious groups. He enjoyed the experience, but then something unusual happened. Instead of hearing his voice coming from his mouth, oh no, (laughs) It sounded as if it came from a place about three feet away, oh, thank God, to his left. (laughs) I couldn't help myself. It went straight to the butt. (laughs) I think Dave's putting some thoughts in my head here. He's having a good time today. I'm glad he joined us. (laughs) Okay, it intrigued him. 
But it also scared him because it felt like he was having a psychedelic experience and losing control over his senses. In, I forgot how we were going to say that. In Dakar, the goal is to fully surrender yourself to the divine presence of God. Not unlike what the mediums did when channeling the dead or what the Pentecostals do when they invited the Holy Spirit to speak through them. Instead of going deeper into the altered state of consciousness, Kevin chose to sit down with the drummers. He felt as though his mind was floating in the clouds. When the ritual came to an end, he found himself in a state of bliss with pleasurable sensations racing through his entire body. Later that night, he awoke from a dream in which he saw himself in a beautiful mosque illuminated by intense patterns of neon lights. But even though he had awakened and opened his eyes, the vision continued for another 30 minutes. As he sat in bed observing the colored lights, he heard a strange melody in the back of his mind. Suddenly, he felt filled with a rare feeling of self-love that continued for over an hour. Then he fell into a very deep sleep, waking up totally relaxed and invigorated. The feelings lasted for several days, and as he described his experience to me, he said, I felt like all of my worries and doubts just fell away. I've never felt such a sense of inner peace. Since Kevin was familiar with Eastern descriptions of the Biggie Enlightenment, I asked him if the experience had changed his life in a fundamental way. Yes, the experience was intense, and yes, the sense of inner peace and self-love was particularly profound. But he soon found himself immersed in his old and familiar feelings of self-doubt. No, I don't think I was the Big E enlightened, he told me. But it showed me that I could reach such a state, and I've used that experience as a beacon to guide me to where I truly want to be. I would say that this was a little E experience, a taste of what the Big E enlightenment could be. For some, the same experience could change their life, their entire lives. And for others, especially those more inclined toward skepticism, it might might mean nothing more than an enjoyable and uplifting experience. That's what makes the Big E Enlightenment so fascinating to study. It can be sudden or gradual, and it depends on how valuable and meaningful the experience is. Kevin's experience made me wonder what kind of brain activity Islamic and Sufi practices might evoke. I suspect that the brain would look similar to the pattern associated with other practices that lead to the Big E Enlightenment experience. And I would soon have the opportunity to find out. But first... A little background about Islam, as it may be one of the most misunderstood religions on the planet, especially to non-followers. Traditional Islam. This is a new section. In today's world, much of the confusion surrounding this 1,500-year-old religion is based on what we hear about extremists. As is true with all religions, many adherents are peaceful, but there are always certain groups who will use selected scriptural passages to incite violence toward others. When this occurs, it's easy to overlook the fact that most religions espouse very positive ideals, such as the Golden Rule, the Ten Commandments, or the peaceful practices of meditation. The term Islam comes from the Arabic verb Aslama, which means to accept, surrender, or submit. And the basis of Muslim spirituality is to open one's heart to the oneness of Allah, the Arabic word for God. Arabic word for God. As you can see, the notion of oneness and surrendering are two of the five main elements found in most of the Big E Enlightenment experiences. However, 
Many people incorrectly assume that God and Allah are different entities. But the Koran is modeled more closely to the Hebrew Bible than to the New Testament. <coughs> New section. God's original name. Oh, this is interesting to me. I wonder how they found out God's original name. Although one does not have to believe in God to reach the biggie enlightenment, God often can provide an important focus for facilitating it. But it depends on how you define God. Think about it for a moment. What does God mean to you? Our research shows that very few people, less than 10%, define this mysterious word in a similar way. The word God first appeared in a 6th century Christian book called the Codex Argentius. C-O-D-E-X and then the other word A-R-G-E-N-T-E-U-S. Prior to that time, Theos was used throughout most of the early Christian writings. It was a term used for any deity and originally came from the Greek word Zeus. The use of the word Allah can be traced back to the 8th century or earlier and continues to be widely used by Middle Eastern Christians, Jews, and Muslims. Most scholars agree that Allah is a variation of the Aramic Elah, E-L-A-H, and the Hebrew Eloah, E-L-O-A-H, or Elohim. E-L-O-H-I-M, a generic word that referred to the highest and most powerful of all the deities, two of whom, named El, E-L, and Al, A-L, were written about in ancient Assyrian, Phoenician, and Babylonian texts. God and Allah are interchangeable in the sense that both refer to a singular deity who created and oversaw humankind. But since the true name of this deity could not be spoken outside the temple that was destroyed nearly 2,000 years ago, indirect names were given. For example, God's name is sometimes referred to using the Hebrew letters Y-O-D, H-E-H, V-A-V, H-E-H, and in parentheses, Y-H-V-H, an unpronounceable word. Boy, you said that. In both Jewish and Muslim mystical traditions, there were many names that were used for God. Infinite knowledge, perfect goodness, all powerful, righteous, oh, all powerful, righteous, supreme being, miracle maker, emancipator, defender, all wise, all forgiving, life giver, and the bringer of death. In some contemporary mystical circles, Allah has been called the source, the breath, or the oneness of everything. These mystical traditions recognized the indescribability of God as well as the importance of an a big E enlightenment experience in which people feel as if they touched God in some profound way. In the mystical paths of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, the follower strives to feel a deep unification with God by surrendering oneself to this holy presence. When this occurs, it often leads a person into a powerful new belief system. I'm trying to get my page to lay flat. Hold on. The glue got extra stuck on this page. Okay. Uh, in Islam, the classic creed of the Shahada states that there is no God but God. In Judaism, there is a foundational prayer, the Shema, S-H-E-M-A, which similarly states, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. 
In the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed reads, There is only one true God, eternal, infinite, and unchangeable, incomprehensible, almighty, and ineffable. Thus, in the three Abrahamic traditions of the West, there is a mutual consensus in the oneness of God. And in that oneness, there are hundreds of qualities and powers associated with this mysterious word. New section, Mystical Islam. Sufism can be tracked back to Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's his name, all of those words. The early Sufis would delve into the Quran reciting key passages while remaining in a deep meditative state until they experienced the direct connection to the divine, the revelation of truth, and the ecstatic experience of pure love and peace, qualities very similar to the Hindu mystical practices of becoming one with pure consciousness. As different Sufi brotherhoods were formed, each one adopted different rituals and theologies. Today you can find hundreds of small neighborhoods groups throughout the Middle East spreading from North Africa to Pakistan and India. Music, dancing, and the repetitive chanting of religious phrases are used to enter trance states. But many mainstream clerics consider such practices heretical. Hair, hair, hair. Heretical. Thank you. Especially since Sufi leaders would often offer radical interpretations of the sacred texts based on their mystical experiences. In the mid 20th century, Sufism became widely known through the English translations of Rumi, R-U-M-I a 13th century Sufi mystic whose poetry often reflected Eastern concepts of the Big E Enlightenment. Different styles of Sufism were introduced to Europe and America, and some even excluded much of the Islamic philosophy from which it emerged. Thus, Western Sufism became a devotional practice based on the concept of little enlightenment through universal love, acceptance, and becoming one with the divine names of God. As is true with most mystical traditions, there is no central orthodoxy or unified doctrine. For these reasons, many scholars do not consider Sufism a religion. Instead, they categorize it with other esoteric wisdom traditions like Native American spirituality, Celtic rituals, etc., found throughout the world. For example, in early Christian Gnostic practices, a person would be enlightened by the divine word. Sufis are not literalists. They are mystics and strive for an enlightenment which connects them deeply to God. What time are we? How far is this section? Ooh, it's a big section. I don't know if I can make it. I'll try. Inside the Sufi brain. Sufis employ a variety of techniques like Dakar, however we say that, to achieve mystical union with the divine. The purpose of Dakar is to remember and embrace the Spirit of God, and it involves a series of complex rituals, like the one I described at the beginning of this chapter. The explicit aim of Dakar is to enter an ecstatic state, hell, H-A-L, that will purify the heart and open the practitioner to spiritual intuition, Kalb, Q-A-L-B. This helps the person overcome the demons, real or imaginary. You know, I don't want to read. I'm not going to be able to get through this section. So I'm going to stop reading the book. We're going to do the next color. (laughs) 
what how do you what what kind of color do you want to do, Colleen? Just the cards? Red, white, black, oh, red? <laughs> red you and know black. those colors. Red and black. Well, yeah. I was thinking <clears throat> maybe we, to simplify, because we started out, you know, uh, what, with the color and the suit. Mm-hmm. And then we went also to the... um Number. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. So I thought, well, maybe if we just go concentrate on either red or black. Okay, uh, why don't you do it this time? Okay. Okay, I'm thinking. Okay. Uh, next week is going to be eight something. Eight. Next uh-huh. week is eight two. I have to write this down or I, I'm completely gone. Colleen did it. <laughs> Colleen always did it. Colleen did it. <laughs> <laughs> or Dolly did it. <laughs> yeah. Did. Did. Yeah. Yeah. D-D-I-D. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, speaking of DDID, oh my gosh, Colleen, you want to share? Do, have you looked at the numbers lately? Um, I don't think I've looked at them today going now, but I'm just... Absolute. We're talking about the YouTube uh, videos that Colleen put up in, the, in uh, her HSR YouTube uh, that we had when we had... T- Taryn on, did show, my show, and then Say What Show, and then he went on uh, M's show. So there's those uh, three different vids. And, Colleen, <laughs> you got the numbers? Well, for some strange reason, my eyes are not seeing. Um, it's got to be... Da, 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 da. Okay, I'm going to just read. I'm hoping. All righty. Here it is. Views coming. for Dilly Dallying in Dolly World, 1,373. Oh, my gosh. It really went up since last night. Oh, yes. And for Say Watts, 589. Wow. And for Up Crossers Creek, 377. Now, I also want to say that Nancy also created video portions of our audios that I put up each week. Uh, so she created some pictures to make it a video. And she did it in two parts for the D. Dilly dallying in Dolly World one. And so they're up there. And the first hour has 75 views on that one. And the second hour has 50 views. So uh, y'all want to see the uh, artwork that Nancy put up with it. I'll put my uh, YouTube channel in the chat room. Uh, so that you can all take a look at those. I also want to mention that I put together a promo because Taryn of American Kabuki, or a.k.a. American Kabuki, is going to join us this Saturday on Dilly Dallying in Dolly World and then again on Say What. So I put together a video <clears throat> a video promo of that as well. Uh, I have been playing the audio part uh, off and on throughout the days that I produce. So, um, Dolly, dip, dip, I'm getting to the chat room now to put in my YouTube. Oh, okay. Um, it's it just blowing our minds. And we don't, we haven't even been on his site to see how many views he's had. No. 
we're just blown away with how many views we've had. Yes, I do want to say, too, that he was very kind and generous to put all of our shows up on his website, which I'm very, very sure has added greatly to the numbers of viewers that we've been getting on those shows. Yes, I think so, too. And I've also got them up on my blog spot at haggyshack.com. If you go into blogs, you can see them there, as well as the promo. And I've also got them up on the two different Facebook pages, because Haggy Shack has her own Facebook as well. Yes. And on this Saturday when Taryn's on, Nancy's going to be, Nancy and Colleen are going to be on Dilly Dallying and Dolly World uh, with Taryn and me. So it will be more like a another, it will be like a round table thingy. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm looking forward to it. Well, I have to say, I was very, very confused when I put the promos together. You know, because we have a guest host on Say What? And it kind of rotates. Oh, that's right. Who's on Saturday? Well, <clears throat> I've got Krista down. Christia. Christia. Yeah. Uh, oh, she was there last week. Well, as I said, there was a bit of confusion. So we may have a surprise guest host. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, but I put it all together and to... It, when you put all that video together and you put it up there, it takes a long time to upload. Oh, uh-huh. So I didn't want to take it all down and do it all over again. So, mm-hmm. surprise! Well, uh, um, did you all ask Christy if she'd do it again next week? Well, uh, Nancy said she was going to. I haven't heard back yet, so. Oh, okay. So it's gonna be a surprise. Yeah. That's cool. We do surprises all the time in this place. Oh, don't we, though? (laughs) There's a lot of shows we don't plan out. It's just is what it is. When And a lot of times the uh, unplanned ones are the best. Yeah, because it's like all impromptu and we don't have, well, we never have a script or anything. Sometimes, I suppose, people have... Like an outline or something. That's nice. just too... I never do. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't do that because, you know, you you get sidetracked and then you go, Oh, my gosh, I didn't cover this. I didn't cover that. <sighs> so you get all uptight about all that stuff. This way it's more natural. It has a good flow. Right. And right. whatever pops in your brain is what we talk about. And Taryn was a last-minute... Literally last minute deal. Last week. Yes. Or last week. I asked him on Friday and he came on on Saturday. That's what I mean, last minute deal. Oh yeah. <laughs> and look how it turned out. And, and the, the chatters, listeners seemed to be very receptive of him. So I was, Pleased with the turnout. I was pleased with the suggestion, but the person, Vanessa, who doesn't want me to say her name doesn't, you know, I shouldn't say that she's the one who, her and Dottie got together and they came up with Taryn and. <laughs> well, that's the way it works. Try this. And so you do yeah. and ba da ba da. There it is. <laughs> yeah. So keep those suggestions coming in. <laughs> um, that's it for me, right? We're at four. We're at four. And uh, now I'm going to... This week I thought I would do two of Dr. Rita's shows back-to-back. Oh, wow. Um, what the heck? Oh, okay. And uh, let me go to my Facebook page because... <sighs> I get so confused. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to my world. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you who the guests are going to be, because I did, like, big write-ups and all that kind of stuff. Oh. 
On Facebook? On my Facebook. Uh, let's see. On Colleen's or Haggy's or Wolf Spirits? Or- yeah, it's Haggy Shack Radio. If you go to Facebook and just do a search for, well, heck, how about I just do it this way? Oh, man. How come things work so well except when you want them to? Uh-huh. Okay, here's the... That's life. Oh, yeah, I'll put that in the chat room as well. Pasty, pasty. Okay. So you're going to do Dr. Rita from uh, four, 4 o'clock to... 6 o'clock. Seven? Oh, to 6. Okay. Right. Um, first up, we have... Her guest is Mark Stavich, who talks about the Emerald Tablets of Tot, the Atlanta Secrets Revealed. Uh, Mark Stavich is the Director of Studies for the Institute for Hermetic Studies. He's a lifelong student of esotericism at, yeah, uh, over 25 years experience in comparative religion, philosophy, psychology, and mysticism with an emphasis on traditional Western esotericism. Wow. Uh, so he's going to speak for an hour, and he's got two books out at least. So all the write-up and all that is on my website. Mm-hmm. And then we have up next, Colleen, I'm telling you what. We have Amit Goswami. (laughs) Go where? (laughs) Goswami. (laughs) Let me see. Where's it at? Well, pour some strange here. Here, 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 here. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I'm sorry, people. My brain is just non-functioning at the moment. Okay. Uh, this is Dr. Rita Louise from Just Energy, Energy Radio. Dr. or well, Amit Goswami is a, uh, okay. The title of the show is, Is an Economic Collapse in Our Future? What's going on with the economy? It seems as if the rich are getting richer and the rest of us are struggling to survive. Join us as theoretical quantum physicist, Dr. Amit Goswami, who is a retired full professor from the University of Oregon's Department of Physics, speaks to Dr. Rita on some of these topics as to the economy and what he thinks is going to happen. So that ought to be rather interesting. He's also written several books. So that's what's coming up next. And then, of course, this evening at 7 o'clock is the Cosmic Reality Radio Show where Nancy and Walt will be talking about the secret space program. Oh, cool. I definitely want to hear that. Oh, yes. And then later on tonight, and you'll probably already be in bed. (laughs) I've got, I found a video the other day on the lost teachings of Jesus that uh, comes from ancient texts that have been kept secret. So that's, that's tonight's slate. Wow. So I can get that last one in the archive, right? Um, well, if it's a video though, I can't. Well, yeah, it is a video. I'll send you the link or I'll put the link to it. Link. Okay. I'll put the link to it in the chat room here. And uh, if I remember it, I'll put it in the chat room then. But it's kind of late at night. So I'll go ahead and put it in here, Dolly, the link for that. And then I'll okay. put it in the chat room too so everybody goes, I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dolly special. She got it. She got it. She did it. <laughs> Well, good on her. 
So uh, yeah. sharing it with y'all. Yeah, I'll, I'll share it as soon as I find it again. <laughs> <laughs> Hang around. She'll get it in there. Don't I'll give up it. on her. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for listening and joining and, and your comments and uh, for p- your participation. You, you don't know how much you all mean to me in my life. I just want to thank you all. Love you. We ready to go, Colleen? I'm ready. See you later, hon. All righty. Bye-bye. I love you. I love you, too. Bye-bye. You just heard Dolly Reads for You with Dolly Howard. Produced by Colleen Kelly on Haggy Shack Radio at HaggyShack.com. Simulcast to Wolf Spirit Radio.